Hey everyone, it's Gia again with another episode of Mullet Over, a Hearthstone review show where we highlight key early game decisions from the Grandmasters, starting from the Mulligan. Week after week, despite how many rounds of nerfs, Demon Hunter remains one of the most broad classes to GM across all the regions, and in my opinion, that's because Demon Hunter is the best tempo deck in the game. Now, the definition of tempo is arguable, but when I say something is a high tempo play, I mean that it achieves immediate development and or immediate removal. So playing a minion on curve is tempo, but playing a minion on curve while also removing your opponent's minion is even higher tempo. Demon Hunter's cards are structured in a way that they can do this consistently right from the get-go, and then they also have card draw and burst for the mid to late game. Perfect, right? So if all of their cards are so good, how exactly are you supposed to approach the mulligan? Well, here's my attempt at breaking it down, but as always, these are guidelines and not hard rules. Three cards are almost universally kept in the mulligan. Battle Fiend, Blazing Battle Mage, and Umberwing. Obviously, the first two are just some of the best statted one-drops in the game. They can trade with common two-cost minions, and when left unchecked, can easily rack up a lot of face damage. But an exception is warranted here in the mirror from Language Hacker, where he chooses to toss his Battle Fiend on the coin. This is because he knows he'll potentially have to react to an opposing Battle Fiend or Battle Mage on turn 1, so he'd rather play his own Battle Mage, which lines up 1 for 1 instead of getting value traded. With Seder Overseer locked up for later, Hacker forgoes Battle Fiend in search of something like Umberwing for turn 2, and he gets it. Speaking of, I think Umberwing is just the most efficient weapon in standard right now, and for that reason, it's kept in many matchups, even without a one drop in hand. You can see Empanizado keeps it here in the mirror with Twin Slice, which allows him to swing back tempo against Language Hacker on turn 2, despite him not being the first to play a minion. So about Twin Slice, this is a card that I almost always keep as Demon Hunter, but watching week 4 of GM, I've learned to look at it on more of a case-to-case -case basis. It's kept frequently because it activates or empowers cards like Umberwing, Battle Fiend, Seder Overseer, and even Glaivebound Adept later on. You can see here Tice keeps Twin Slice along with the Seder, which itself can be a synergy keep. Versus Rogue, Seder Overseer on curve is quite weak to the removal like Backstab or Kobold Lackey, but with Twin Slice, you can put two threats on board as early as turn 3. But of course, Twin Slice can be underwhelming if you're not able to develop minions alongside it. In this game versus Rogue, Monsanto tosses it to look for minions or Umberwing to follow up his battle mage on curve. And in this game, Nalgidon tosses it versus Zoo in order to look for more proactive plays like one-drop minions. However, there's also an argument for keeping it against Zoo, especially when you have a guaranteed play on turn 1. Twin Slice can be kept as flexible removal in conjunction with the Demon Hunter hero power. In this game, Frozen keeps it versus Zoo with a Battle Mage in hand. And versus Warrior, Language Hacker decides to keep Twin Slice given that he already had plays on turns 1 and 2. Where it gets really interesting for Demon Hunter is, of course, the Outcast cards. Crimson Sigil Runner and I Beam are kept far more frequently in the Mulligan when they're in the leftmost spot in hand. This means that the player doesn't have to fulfill any additional conditions to get the outcast effect, whereas in any other position, you might have to worry about them getting locked in the middle by heavy draws. In this game versus Rogue, Galen tosses his sigil runner that was in the rightmost position of his hand, but keeps I-beam in the leftmost slot for guaranteed cheap removal. In Frozen and Firebat's Demon Hunter Mirror, they both keep their outcast cards on the far left hand position. However, there are situations where you can keep outcast cards in the middle of your hand. Bloody Face does so in this mirror because his leftmost cards, Twin Slice, Crimson Sigil Runner, and Umberwing, can be comfortably played on turns 1 and 2. In other words, he's already planned to free up the I-Beam from the left side, and his big outcast turn on 3 mana puts him well in the lead. In the mirror particularly, you might see more reactive cards like Chaos Strike kept by the player going second. This is admittedly inferior tempo compared to something like Umbra Wing plus Twin Slice, but the 2 damage removal is so essential against 1 drops that Chaos Strike can be a welcome compromise, as both Monsanto and Eddie demonstrate. Outside of Mulligans, 
great demon hunter play also hinges on the first few decisions once the minions start to hit the board. Three of those minions you might see included in tempo demon hunter lists but aren't core are Frenzied Felwing, Frozen Shadow Weaver, and Beaming Sidekick. After getting nerfed from 3 to 2 health, Frenzied Felwing was cut from a lot of lists but can still be pretty insane if even one of your early minions gets one attack in. Eddie just pops off with the fell wings in this game versus Rogue as early as turn 2. But in the mirror, you don't exactly have the license to go face early because board control is such a priority. That was just the risk Eddie was running in this game, where he was unable to play even one of them until turn 7. On the flip side, Frozen Shadow Weaver is a great tech for the mirror. You can see Alutemo using it to freeze Flurry's face on curve, which means Flurry can't buff his Battle Fiend for a good trade. And in this mirror's turn 5, Firebat times his Shadow Weaver to lock out Frozen's Glaivebound Adept on curve. Beaming Sidekick is the most recent development in Demon Hunter technology, in no small part due to the mirror and rogue matchups. The small health buff to Battle Fiend or Blazing Battle Mage early on can be such an annoyance for opponents to remove, like how Hunter Ace does against Falcane. However, the sidekick won't always get value, and as Galen clearly demonstrates versus Nalgadon, you shouldn't let the wasted value fallacy prevent you from playing for tempo. The early game plan for Demon Hunter is simple. Minions on board equals good, even if they aren't battle fiends. But what if you have all of your best one drops? The sequence in which you decide to play your threats is mostly dependent on the matchup. In this game versus Dawn, Staz decides to play his Crimson Sigil Runner on turn 1 over Battle Fiend. I think this is smart against specifically Rogue, which often wants to equip their dagger on turn 2. Had Staz started with Battle Fiend and then played Sigil Runner, given that he didn't know he'd get Umberwing off the top, it would have died to backstab and the runner to an easy turn 2 from Dawn. Instead, because Staz played the Sigil Runner on 1, Don chooses to use his backstab on it for immediate tempo and play Blackjack Stunner to hopefully stick a Praise Galakron target for the following turn. But then, Staz seizes back the board with Twin Slice and his Battle Fiend goes unanswered, later winning the game. Here in the mirror, Felcane with a handful of 1-drops also decides to forego Battle Fiend on turn 1. This is because he expects something like a Battle Mage on the other side. Had he played Battle Fiend, he would have locked himself into having to use hero power to buff up its attack and prevent it from getting value traded. Instead, by playing Battle Mage, he allows himself the flexibility to follow up with Beaming Sidekick and Battle Fiend for higher tempo on the next turn. Hunter Ace ended up building a different board that Felcane had to use I Beam to clear, but I think in most other panouts, the Battle Mage works out better for Felcane. I hope you are now prepared to jam some Demon Hunter, and I'll see you next week for another Mullet Over.